Today's topic is floating point numbers. We can express the counting numbers with binary integers and positive and negative whole numbers using two's complement. However, the range of these numbers is limited by the word size in use, and there's no convenient way to represent fractions. Floating point numbers address both of these problems, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Floating point numbers are approximations, and that can cause a different set of problems. Let's review for a moment how decimal fractions work. We use a decimal point to represent fractions, and the fractional part is to the right of the decimal point. So 0.1 is the same as 1 tenth, and that is the same as 10 to the minus 1 power. 0 0.01 is 1 one hundredth, or 10 to the minus 2 power. Decimal numbers are based on powers of 10, and decimal fractions are based on negative powers of 10. Unlike the integers, not all fractions can be represented exactly. For example, the fraction one-third can't be represented exactly as a decimal fraction. However, within the limits of finite precision arithmetic, we can be arbitrarily precise. If 0.3 isn't close enough, we can use 0.33 or 0.3333, or even a decimal point followed by 12 threes but only within the limits of finite precision arithmetic. If we don't have room to store 12 threes, we can't be that precise. Binary fractions work the same way. We use a binary point to represent the fractional part, and the digits to the right of the binary point are the fractional digits. So 0.1 base 2 is the same as 1 half, and that's the same as 2 to the minus 1 power. 0 0.01 base 2 is 1 fourth, or 2 to the minus 2 power. Binary numbers are based on powers of 2, and binary fractions are based on negative powers of 2. As with decimal numbers, not all fractions can be represented exactly using the binary fraction form. One third can't be represented exactly, and interestingly, one tenth can't be represented exactly. It's important to remember that computers work with finite precision arithmetic, that is, arithmetic on a fixed number of digits, because forgetting that can lead to wrong answers when you're working with big numbers, with very small numbers, or with complex numerical problems. Let's review something we learned in high school, namely scientific notation. The speed of light is 300 million meters per second, about and we can represent that as a 3 followed by 8 zeros, but we can represent it much more compactly as 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. The idea of scientific notation, and also of floating point numbers, is to separate the precision, that is the significant digits of a number, from the magnitude. Using scientific notation, and also using floating point, we can use two fairly small numbers, the 3 and the 8 in the example, to represent one really big number. We can use the same idea to represent very small numbers. We can adjust the decimal point to make the fractional part be a true fraction. For example, 3 times 10 to the 8th is the same as 0.3 times 10 to the 9th. Shifting the decimal part one place to the right increases the exponent by 1. The number of digits in the fractional part determines the precision of the number. If one digit of precision isn't enough, we can use more digits in the fractional part. That is, if we're writing with scientific notation. Floating point numbers use the same principle but the precision is limited by the storage size of the floating point number. The general form of a number in scientific notation is that the number n is equal to s, the significand, the fractional part holding the significant digits, times 10 to the power x. In scientific notation, the radix or base is 10, and the multiplier is a power of 10 x is the exponent, the power to which the base is raised to form a multiplier. Some books use e for this, but e is the base of the natural logarithm, which is confusing. We can make the transition from scientific notation to floating point this way. Floating point numbers use the same idea, that is, we separate the precision from the magnitude and use two relatively small numbers in a way that lets us represent very big and very small values. 
The difference is that the significand s is a binary fraction, and the base, the radix, is 2, so the exponent represents a power of 2. The floating point number n is equal to the binary fraction significand s times 2 to the power of the exponent. The number of bits in s, the fractional part, determines the maximum precision of the number, and it's called the significand to remind you of that. The number of bits in x, the exponent, determines the maximum and minimum magnitude of the multiplier, and so limits the range that can be represented. This is the 32-bit format of the IEEE 754 binary floating point standard. Many modern floating point implementations use the 64-bit format, and there are formats with more than 64 bits. IEEE 754 numbers are signed magnitude numbers with a sign bit that is 0 for positive and 1 for negative. The exponents in the 32-bit format have an effective range of minus 126 to plus 127. The significand holds the significant digits. It's 23 bits, but there's a trick to be explained soon that allows for 24 bits of precision. So a 32-bit floating point format, n, the number, is equal to s, the significand, times 2 to the x power, and is positive if the sign bit is 0, negative if the sign bit is 1. Consider 0.2997 times 10 to the 9th meters per second is the same as 0 0.002997 times 10 to the 11th meters per second. However, if we only have four digits of precision, that becomes 0 0.0029 times 10 to the 11th. Leading zeros in the fractional part of a number are not significant and can cost precision when we're using finite precision arithmetic. A number in which the leftmost digit of the fractional part is non-zero is called normalized. Numbers are normalized to keep the maximum number of significant digits. Now here's the trick I mentioned a moment ago. In binary fractions, if the leftmost bit of the significand is non-zero, it can only be a 1. Since we know that this bit must be a 1, we don't need to store it, and we can get 24 bits of significand, of fraction, for the price of 23. What about no such thing as a free lunch? That extra bit is not free. It takes computational work to normalize the number. The extra bit is called an implicit bit, and the normalized number is represented as having an implicit bit to the left of the binary point and the bits of the stored significand to the right. In other words, the binary significand of a normalized number will be greater than or equal to 1 and less than 2. Terminology, the exponent represents a power of 2, the fractional part is called the significand, a floating point number is normalized when the leftmost bit of the significand is non-zero. Let's consider how the precision and range of floating point numbers works, and we're going to use 32-bit numbers in this example. The fractional part is 24 bits. 2 to the 24th is a little more than 16 million, and that gives us decimal precision of a little bit more than 7 decimal digits. The exponent can range from 2 to the minus 126 to 2 to the plus 127, and we'll explain how that works in a moment. That gives us an approximate range of plus or minus 10 to the minus 38 to plus or minus 10 to the plus 38. Every integer in plus or minus 10 to the 24th can be represented exactly using this format, and many of the powers of 2 times integers can be represented exactly, but everything else is an approximation. So let's look some more at range of single precision, that is 32-bit floating point numbers. Starting on the right, numbers of greater than 2 to the plus 127 can't be represented in 32 bits because 127 is the largest exponent that's available. 
The circumstance that we have a number too large to represent is called positive overflow. Numbers too small to represent are those less than 2 to the minus 126. Minus 126 is the smallest exponent available, and so numbers smaller can't be represented. This is called positive underflow. We'll talk about underflow some more in a moment. The number 0 can be represented exactly. Underflow and overflow can occur on the negative numbers, too. A negative number too close to 0 to be represented is called negative underflow, and a negative number too far from 0 to be represented is called negative overflow. The IEEE 754 standard uses XSN exponents. XSN numbers are also called biased numbers. The number is an unsigned number that has a fixed value added to it, that is, the bias. The true value is formed by subtracting the bias from the number. In single precision, that is, 32-bit floating-point numbers, the bias is 127, so the numbers are excess 127 for exponents. Values 0 and 255 for the exponent are reserved. The true value of the exponent is computed by subtracting the bias, that's a 127, from the stored value. So a stored value of 1, 0 is reserved, so 1 is the smallest stored value, is 1 minus 127, and that's a minus 126. 254 is the largest non-reserved stored value, and the true value is 254 minus 127, and that gives us a plus 127. Why do we do this? The XSN form is used because it allows for bitwise comparison for greater than or less than. We talked about underflow a little bit ago. In floating point, underflow is a number that's too small to represent. By too small, we mean too close to zero. What that really means is that the negative exponent would require too many bits. Example, for 32-bit numbers, minus 126 is the closest to zero exponent we can represent. What if we need minus 128? We can't do it with that 8-bit excess 127 exponent. Just ending a computation with an error when a number gets very small is bad. The IEEE standard was changed in 2008 to prevent that. When a number becomes too small to represent, IEEE 754-2008 allows an exponent of zero and leading zeros in the significand. These are called subnormal numbers. A production of a subnormal number triggers an inexact warning. That's because subnormal numbers lose significant digits as the value approaches zero. If a number continues to get smaller, it will eventually reach zero. So given that we have subnormal numbers, let's look again at the range. IEEE 754 provides representations for positive and negative infinity. So instead of positive overflow, we can set a number greater than 2 to the plus 127 to positive infinity and numbers less than 2 to the minus 126 can be allowed to become subnormal and get increasingly close to zero. The same thing happens on the negative side. Subnormal numbers in the area very close to zero and negative infinity in the area very far from zero. I mentioned earlier that there are other floating point formats than the 32-bit format. The most common other format is the double precision or 64-bit floating point format. There's a sign bit, then 11 bits of exponent. That provides a range of minus 1022 to plus 1023. The significant is 52 bits plus one implicit bit. That gives us about 15.9 decimal digits of precision and a range of plus or minus 10 to the minus 308 to plus or minus 10 to the plus 308. There are also 128-bit quadruple precision formats and 256-bit octuple precision formats in the IEEE 754 standard. 
When a calculated value can't be represented exactly in a floating point number, it is rounded to the nearest representable number. You might wonder if we're using only 32 or 64 bits, how rounding is accomplished. The hardware computes using a larger number of bits, for example, 80 bits for 32 or 64 bits, and then rounds to 32 or 64 bits for storage. Usually, rounding errors cancel each other out. However, sometimes rounding errors can accumulate, and so it's necessary to be careful. If you are working with complex floating point arithmetic, you should probably have a look at floating hyphen point hyphen GUI dot DE, the floating point guide. It's important to remember that floating point numbers are approximations. How many different values can be represented in 32 bits? Well, 2 to the 32nd, which is about 4 billion. How many real numbers are there between minus 10 to the plus 38 and plus 10 to the plus 38? Infinitely many, but we can only represent about 4 billion of them. So most floating point numbers are approximations. Let's look at an example using Python. I type 0.1 times 0.1, and I get 0.1, which is right, but then a string of zeros and a 2. The number 0.1 base 10 can't be represented exactly in binary, so what gets stored is an approximation. And since we have finite precision arithmetic, that approximation is limited. Subtraction of nearly equal numbers can cancel with catastrophic loss of precision. So let's look at an example where we subtract 3.1415 from 3.1416. There's only one significant digit of precision in five digits. And if we used four digits of precision, the result would be zero. The subtraction would cancel catastrophically. In addition, using floating point numbers, adding a very small number to a very large number can produce an incorrect answer. For example, suppose we have a floating point number with an exponent of 4 and a significant of 1, and we add an exponent of minus 1 and a significant of 1, and we're working with four digits of precision. We adjust the exponents so that both of them have an exponent of 4, that gives our smaller number a value of 0 0.0001. If we're working with four digits of precision, that addition gives us not 1.0001, it gives us 1.000. The addition effectively did not happen. Because floating point numbers are approximate, the associative law does not hold. You learned probably in 8th grade, that A plus B plus C, with the parentheses around B plus C, should be equal to parentheses A plus B plus C. Let's test that using Python. I set my numbers A equals 0.1, B equals 0.2, C equals 0.3. I compute A plus parentheses B plus C, and I get 0.6, which makes sense. Then I compute parentheses A plus B plus C, and I get 0.6, a string of zeros, and a 1. The two are not equal. There are several things that don't work using floating point numbers. The associative law does not work. A plus parenthesis B plus C might not be equal to parenthesis A plus B plus C. The distributive law a plus B times C might not be equal to A times C plus B times C. This one is very important. Comparisons for equality, including comparison to zero, is unreliable. Instead, you should always check for close enough. If you're using floating point numbers, if A and B are floating point numbers, 
A, the comparison, if A equals B, is likely to be unreliable. Instead, we're going to check for close enough. We're going to check for A minus B being less than epsilon. The slide says that works for suitable epsilon. Epsilon is a mathematician's expression of a very small value. Hungarian mathematician Paul Erdős referred to his children as epsilons, little things. In the example, epsilon represents a value that signifies two values are close enough to be considered equal. In money, two values could be considered equal if they're less than one-half cent of each other, so epsilon would be 0 .005. Uh, another example, a cabinet maker works to tolerances of 1 32nd of an inch. Two values would be close enough if they're less than 1 64th of an inch apart, or 0 0.015635. Plenty point numbers have some special values with specific representations. Zero is representable exactly, and so is negative zero because floating point numbers are signed magnitude. Positive and negative infinity have special representations. There is a representation for this thing called not a number. And we need to talk a little more about that. Not a number is generated by illegal mathematical operations, illegal operations on infinity, operations that generate complex results, like the square root of a negative number. Any comparison to not a number, including comparing not a number to itself, results in not equal. So let's look at a summary of floating point. The key idea is separating precision from magnitude so that we can use two relatively small numbers to represent very big and very small numbers. We're trading precision for range. There is no free lunch. Floating point numbers should be normalized for best precision. Floating point numbers are approximate. That means you can't compare them for equality reliably. Rounding errors can accumulate. Floating point arithmetic is both approximate and finite precision arithmetic. The associative and distributive laws do not reliably apply. Why is this important? Well, there are a number of examples where programming errors caused disasters, and many of those were misuse of floating point numbers. In February of 1991, an American Patriot missile failed to track and intercept an Iraqi Scud missile. Problem, floating point truncation. The floating point number wasn't big enough. The result, 28 American soldiers were killed and another 100 were injured. So what do you need to know? For this course, you're not expected to be an expert in numerical analysis. You do need to be aware of the limitations of computer arithmetic with both integers and floating point numbers. You do need to be able to recognize situations where problems might arise so that you or someone can do further investigation. For example, you need to be really sure of the actual range of values held in a floating point number before trying to convert it to integer. In the 1980s, the Therac-25, a radiation therapy machine, killed several patients and permanently injured others. The cause? Incorrect conversion of floating point to integer. That is everything I have to say about floating point numbers please ask questions in Desire to Learn.